Let's pray. Lord in heaven, thank you for drawing us together this morning and fulfilling our hearts with your spirit. We do praise you, Lord, and we pray you will enable us to praise when we are weak, when we are full of doubt, when we are troubled. May we still see above it all your glory. And this morning in this service, draw us close to yourself. Fill us, mold us, and shape us for service in the week to come is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I looked over the offering for what it is for this week, the Washington Conference, it it struck me yet again, it takes a village. And I think of the Washington Conference as this big village that holds, maybe even city, that holds all of us individual churches and does things that we aren't big enough to do. I went on the website yesterday just to see what Washington Conference Ministries entailed yet again, because I always forget, and this is the, the page. Those of you who are close can see that it's full of things that Washington Conference Ministries do. Let me mention a couple of them. We have ministries for children, including Sabbath School and Vacation Bible School. We have ministries for youth including Sunset Lake Camps, youth, young adults, pathfinders, adventurers, things for seniors with SAGE ministries, things for singles, things for uh, families, things for health and camp meeting and prayer. All of these things are covered under Washington Conference Ministries. And they're all things that are much more than one individual person or family or church family can do. So today, consider giving, or consider giving online today or later for Washington Conference Ministries. Will the deacons please stand? Lord our God, thank you so much for all of the blessings you've given us individually. Thank you that we have the opportunity to give corporately so that our village can provide services and ministries to many. In Jesus' name, amen.
on now. So today's story is about Jack the cat. Jack the cat was a wild cat. He lived in the woods, but occasionally he got tired of chasing mice because mice run fast and you have to work hard to catch mice. And he got tired of chasing birds because the birds would fly away. And he got really hungry. So, occasionally, he would sneak out of the woods and go up to the farmer's barn. Because the farmer had cats. And the farmer put food out for the cats. And the food in the bowl didn't run away. And so Jack would come up to the bowl and... He would snarf that food up so fast, just like that, and then run back to the woods. And he would do this every now and then, and then one day something bad happened. You know what it was? A girl saw Jack in the barn. Uh Uh-oh. And when Jack saw the girl, Jack ran out of the barn faster than he'd ever run in his life because people are dangerous. You never know what they might do to you. So he stayed in the woods for a long time because he didn't want people to see him. But then what happened to his stomach? It started getting empty and he started getting hungry and the mice ran away too fast and the birds flew off too quickly and so he went back to the barn to see if there was some food. And there was not food, so he hid in the hay bales. And when the food was out, he went and ate some more food. This went on for months. And you know what? Sometimes that same girl saw Jack. And you know what this girl got to thinking? I'm going to catch that cat. Oh... And if you knew this girl, you would know that if she's trying to catch the animal, the animal is going to get caught. So she tried all kinds of tricks, putting food, trying to catch him in boxes. And finally she came up with a trick because Jack could never resist the food. Now, he should have been thinking, ah, this food is put out here. I know the food's, there's a trick somewhere, but hey, he was hungry. So he went in one of the, a cage, and he started eating the food, and the girl shut the door behind him and trapped the cat. Whoa. So if you're a wild cat and you're inside a little cage, are you happy? No, you are scared to death. What are they going to do, cook you for dinner? No. Oh, because they think a person's just like a big coyote, you know? When they, coyotes look at cats and they go, yum, yum. We don't think that, do we? No, nah, we don't. But Jack thought we did. So the girl took Jack in the crate and then hauled him off to a place called the vet. Oh, and he had a little operation, and he had some shots. This was not good. And then he was taken back to the barn, and you know what the girl did? She let him out of the cage. And then she started putting food out for Jack. And she would deliberately come and just stick her head in the door, and Jack would look and he'd freeze. But she didn't come in, so okay, and then he'd go back to eating. And days and days went by, and she started getting closer and closer and closer. And she would stand right by Jack while he ate. And Jack didn't want her to be that close, but he couldn't help eating. And finally, she reached down and touched him. But she didn't hurt him. And after a while, you know what? Jack and the girl became friends. But there was somebody else who would come in the barn. The old man farmer. Now Jack had figured out that girls were nice. But old men, you never know what they're going to do to you. Besides, he had heard some of the mean things that old man said about cats. I don't want any more cats around here. And he believed what the farmer said. The girl didn't. 
And so, yeah, many days, the farmer would come out, and as soon as Jack saw the farmer, he would hide. If the girl came out, Jack was cool. The farmer would come out, Jack would disappear. But then the girl went off to school, and guess who was feeding the cats every morning? The old farmer. And guess what Jack liked to do? Eat. And so then he began to think, wow, this farmer guy, he's dangerous, but he brings food. But then the girls put the cat food up high on a shelf because the dogs were raiding the cat food. And that was not a problem when Jack was younger, but then Jack got a little older and a little white. Jack became a fat cat, a big fat cat. And Jack could not jump up on the shelf. And now he faced the ultimate dilemma. The farmer would come in and put the food in the bowl. And Jack would be on the floor and he could see there was food in the bowl. And he couldn't jump that high. What's Jack going to do? What do you think he did? What would you do if you're on the floor and the food's up there and you can't reach it? What? Now that's what you would do. Yeah, I think that's a smart move. Can get, cats get ladders? You know what Farmer John tried to do? Farmer John tried to get a ladder for the cat. Yep. But you know what? The girl said, nah, no good. That would be a good idea. And in fact, there were some boxes there. And when he was younger, he could jump on them. But you know what he found? Oh, yes? He could um, jump on a counter. The counter um, is low. And yes. And that's, he, he had done that. He would go in the hay room and then jump through a window and then go up over there. But he had gotten too big and he couldn't do that. And so you know what Jack finally had to do? It was the worst thing he ever did in his life. The food was up there, Jack was there, and there's Farmer John. And you know what Jack did? He kind of stood still and let Farmer John pick him up. It was the scariest thing he had ever done. And when Farmer John picked him up, you could feel his body was tight as a board. He thought, oh no, Farmer John's gonna bite my head off. <laughs> Farmer John didn't bite his head off. Farmer John put him up on the shelf. And he ate his breakfast. And now every morning, when I go out in the morning, he's still a little nervous. But I go put food in the bowl, and Jack the cat comes over and says, okay, pick me up. Pick me up now. And I pick him up, and he eats his breakfast. I don't know how he gets down. I guess he jumps. Anyway. Okay, today we are going to talk about new pictures of God. Just like Jack got a new picture of Farmer John. Let's get our buckets and pick up the hands across the water offering.
O oh God, our maker, our defender, our redeemer, and our friend, we're so thankful for this place to meet and worship you in comfort and in peace. We come here today with much on our hearts and minds. We hear of so many places in the world where there isn't any comfort and there isn't any peace, and it often seems impossible that people will coexist, much less work together. The issues are huge, they're so long-standing, and as individuals, we're so very small to make a difference. And we read of outbreaks of frightening illness in countries with insufficient medical care, and we don't know how to help or even what to ask for other than to say over and over, Oh Lord, our trust is in you. Much closer to our everyday life are those in our church community who've had accidents or sickness or surgery. We name especially Scott and Roger and Charles and Angie. We know of some who have financial distress or worries about school or job or family. And if we each named them all aloud every now, we would, right now, we would fill the, this, the church with names. We thank you so much for prayers that have been answered and that those friends and ones in our church family who are on the road to recovery are doing so much better. And we name especially Angie and Donna and Susanna. And again, Lord, if we named all of the names and we listed all of the blessings, we would fill the church with sound. We say over and over again, our trust and strength is in you. Help us to do what we can to comfort and relieve those at home and in the wider world. Help us to be your hands and your feet in this world. We know that sometimes we do a poor job of letting you shine through us. <clears throat> Please forgive us our pride, our selfishness, our impatience, our inadequate love for you and for treating others as we don't wish to be treated. Thank you that you're willing to forgive us and to make us whole. Create in us new hearts. Renew right spirits within us. Today, Lord, we especially pray for Cypress School as the school year is about to start. Please send your spirit and your blessing upon the school and Lowell, the teachers and staff and students and the budget. Please help them to have a successful and a wonderful Christ-filled school year. Thank you, Lord, that you listen and you're, now, you're with us now, both in this worship service and afterwards when we return to our daily life refreshed and energized to do your will. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Then Elisha went out and told them, You have come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me and I will take you to the man you are looking for. And he led them into the city of Samaria. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha replied. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and sent them home to their master. And after that, the Aramean raiders 
stayed away from the land of Israel. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over ninety-nine others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. So about 10 days ago, 
Wednesday evening. I'm sitting at my favorite table on the sidewalk outside Teddy's Bigger Burgers, eating my veggie burger and working on my sermon. Sun is shining. It's a beautiful afternoon. Green Lake in summer is the prettiest place in the world. And as I'm eating my burger and working on my sermon, you know, trying not to get goop on the keys of the computer, I see some teenagers walking up the street toward me. I don't know, 15, 16 years old, I'm guessing. I don't know. Seems to me, if I remember right, three boys and a girl. And as they get right within earshot, one of the guys says to the girl, so I hear you're an atheist. And the girl goes, yeah, and then she begins to explain what that was about. And of course, by then, they've walked on by, and I'm left going, so what did she say? Hey, come back, kids. Let's talk about this. Uh, They did not come back. I did not say come back. (laughs) I've been doing a series called Church and Young Atheists. And it's important for me to, to emphasize again that for most people my age and perhaps people significantly younger than I am, the word atheist means something different than it does for a lot of people who are in their teens and 20s. Um, Certainly when I was 15, if somebody else had asked me if I'm an atheist, if I had said yes, it would not have been with, oh yeah, it would not have been part of an easy, relaxed, casual conversation. This would have, oh, you know. And so it's important as we talk about church and young atheists that we allow them to live in their culture and that we hear the language and and the ideas they're expressing in the context of their culture and not insist that they learn to talk so we understand. Our job is to understand, not to require them to speak in approved fashion. What... What did she mean when she said, yeah, I'm an atheist? I want to ask you, what do you mean when you say, I believe in God? So now we'll go to a Bible story. It's part of our scripture reading. Long time ago, there was a new king in Damascus. At least I assume there was a new king. The Bible doesn't give all the details I'm going to shamelessly embellish. There was a new king in Damascus, a kid. He had just come on the throne. I'm guessing he was a 20-something. Dad had died. He's now, you know, after years of waiting and preparation, he's now on the throne. And he needs to demonstrate that he really is in charge because he's surrounded by these old advisors, you know, people who had been hanging with his dad for 40 and 50 years. And, you know, he's king now. So he needs to, he needs to demonstrate some leadership. And what does a red-blooded king do to demonstrate leadership? You go to war. Sometimes presidents do that. Now... He wasn't dumb. This was not an all-out, win-it-or-lose-everything kind of war. But still, it was military action that would show that he was in charge. So he plans a series of cross-border raids into Israel, the neighbor to the south. Ambushes. I'm guessing the idea was hit soft targets grab a lot of booty, get back across the border, you enrich the treasury, you've demonstrated that you're in charge. You know, it's a great way to get going as as a new king. So, king gets his army together, they head across the border, they set up perfect ambushes. I mean, the camouflage is exquisite. They manage to not, you know, they get into the country with nobody knowing it is perfect. They set up on this highway, you know, expecting a wagon load of of grain or maybe a caravan carrying some really expensive stuff. 
you know, they, they know this is a trafficked route. It's a perfect ambush. And they sit there for three days and nothing happens. Nobody, there's not a mouse running across the road. The, the place is empty. That was weird. So, you know, a month later, he tries it again, a different place. He does it time after time, five times, ten times, we don't know. Sets up these perfect ambushes. Places where he knows valuable stuff's going to come by. Nothing. Crawls home embarrassed. Finally, he calls a meeting you know, of his warrior circle. All right, guys. I want to know who is spilling secrets to the Israelites down south. I mean, one of you is, because, I mean, once or twice, it could be a coincidence, but somebody is passing secrets to the enemies. And you think for a minute, I mean, the king's eyes are bugging out. He is mad, and remember, he is young. He's a fireball. He needs to demonstrate leadership. He needs to take out somebody. And all these officers, they know they're innocent. But that doesn't make them not nervous. Because what if somebody else, you know, to shield themselves, points the finger? You know, you're done for. Maybe some of these officers had Israeli servants. That could look suspicious. Maybe some of them had an Israeli mistress or wife. Now we're really, oh, it's you. We knew it. Off with his head. And it had been off. I mean, that was not, that was, that was due process. Cut his head off. The place is, you know, deadly silent. People are scared to death. Finally, an old man speaks up. He's over to the king's right, old enough to be the king's dad. He had worked with the king's dad for decades. He says, well, sir, don't be too hard on your men. I know who's telling the secrets. <gasps> you do? Yeah, yeah, I do, but it's, it's nobody here. Oh. He said, sir, there's a prophet down in Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of Israel. There's a prophet down in Samaria. This guy, you're, you're too young to remember. Uh, no, no offense. You're too young to remember. But a long time ago, one of your dad's commanders got leprosy. He had an Israelite servant girl. She said, go down to Samaria. There's a prophet that'll heal you. He went down with a bucket load of gold and he came back well. There's even rumors this guy raised the dead. Sir, I suspect that the prophet Elisha can tell the king of Israel what you say to your woman when the two of you have your head on one pillow. Now, the king does what any young in-charge person would do. Well, if that's the guy, go arrest him. I always get a kick out of this. Um... So Elisha can tell the king of Israel what the king of Damascus says in his bedroom, and now we're going to, by surprise, go and capture Elisha. I mean, it sounds like a great plan if you leave out the fact that Elisha knows that this is coming. But, hey, details. Go get him. So the special forces, you know, they get together. They go down to the town of Dothan because they've heard that's where Elisha is. They surround the town, and as far as they can tell, the, the prophet is still in the town. God must not have told them. The magic didn't work this time. So they surround the town. Then in the morning, sun comes up. They're making preparations to attack. And an old man, they see an old man up on a rooftop just inside the wall. And the old man goes out on the rooftop and they see him raise his hands toward heaven and that's the last they see. While they're watching at this man with his arms raised toward heaven, they go blind. Well, one guy goes blind and he assumes it's just him and then he realizes, no, it's the guy... The whole army has been smitten blind. They're deep in the heart of enemy territory, and somebody with some pretty powerful magic has just blinded all of them. A little bit later, 
they hear a man's voice, old man's voice. I don't know how to do voices, but it's an old man's voice. And he's going, um, hey, where's the commander? And somehow these blind people manage to get the old man and the commander in speaking distance. And the old man says to the commander, hey, what's up? What are you, what are you guys looking for? Uh, well, we're looking for Elisha. And the old man starts laughing. He says, oh, are you guys... You're at the wrong place. You're looking for the wrong person. Ah, you're all messed up. That was true. But follow me, and I'll take you to the guy you're looking for. Now, these guys were not idiots. They, this has got to be a setup. And if you've watched movies or read, you know, fairy tale books or whatever, this is a setup. You know you're you're being led to your doom. But if you're blind and in the heart of enemy territory. And somebody says, follow me. What are your options? So the commander has the guys lined up, you know, hand on the guy in front of you and hand on the guy beside you and this whole, whole army, you know, is shuffling down the road, following this old man. Yeah, come on, come on. Hours walking. They're hot, they're hungry, they're thirsty. And then they can tell they have gone through something, you know, entrance to a cave, through a gate. You know, they've been out in the open, and you can hear, you know, they, it's, the tension has got to be killer right now. You know, if these guys weren't in good shape, they'd have a heart attack and die. So they go inside, and then they hear the old man's voice. And again, the old man prays. He addresses his God. Oh, Lord, open their eyes. They can see. This is not good. You know, they're looking at arrows knocked and drawn bows. Swords lifted, spears pointed. They are in a town square surrounded by unfriendly forces. Surprise, surprise. And the king says, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Elisha has smote, smitten, has smitten them with blindness. Now the king says, shall I smite them? And it means what the New Living Translation said, shall I kill them? Shall I obliterate them? Now imagine for a minute that the prophet was not there, that he led them to the gate, and then he said, "Um, you talk to the king, I'm, I'm going back to Dothan. Oh, but I'll pray on the way and I'll open their eyes. So imagine you're there with the king when their eyes open. And the king says to you, shall I smite them? Shall I obliterate them? And it's up to you to determine God's will in this situation. Your call. What does God want the king to do? So you think, hmm, I'm an Adventist. I should do a Bible study. So you go to Deuteronomy, and Moses describes their interaction with Sihon, king of Heshbon. We wiped them out, man, woman, and child. You go to the book of Joshua, and you read about Jericho. God said, wipe them out, man, woman, child, donkey, horse, and even Jack the cat. Then you go to the book of Samuel, and Samuel the prophet gives King Saul clear, unambiguous, specific directions. Go over to those Amalekite people and get rid of them. Completely. And when Saul didn't do it completely, he failed to kill one cat, the king. He was rebuked and removed from the throne of Israel because he didn't do it. 
If that's been your Bible study, and now the king says, I have here in front of me a whole bunch of guys, they have been engaged in naked aggression. We didn't attack them, they attacked us repeatedly. The only reason they had empty ambushes is because the prophet warned the Israelite king, don't go there. Their intention had been deadly, hostile. They, they are pagans. They worship false gods. They have idols. And here's this army in your town square. What do you do with them? Now, you know in your gut the right answer. Your gut tells you mercy. If you're a soldier, you know what civilized standards call for. Again, the New Living Bible puts it even more plainly than the older translations. You don't kill prisoners of war. But, but what is that instinct on your gut toward mercy? What is that tradition of civilization that we don't kill uh, prisoners of war against the plain, clear words of Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Samuel. So, you're supposed to speak for God. And you're, you're, you're let me start over. You're supposed to speak for God and your young atheist friend, the one that grew up going to your church schools, and graduated from your colleges and took the best that you had to teach them and understood that it imposed on us obligations of mercy and justice. They're listening to you as you advise the king what to do. And let me be as blunt as I can. Are you going to do what those Bible texts say or are you going to do the right thing? Thank you. And that's what every young person will tell you. And that's what they mean when they say, I'm an atheist. They don't know how to explain how we get from Deuteronomy and Joshua and Samuel to Jesus' statement, love your enemies. They don't know how to build all the sophisticated stuff that allows you to reason your way from there to there, but they know the right answer. And since they know they can't build a nice, tidy little bridge, they deny there's a need for a bridge because they know the right answer. And we know the right answer. And Elisha spoke for God. Do not kill them. It's a dumb question. Feed them, give them water, and send them back to their master. No conditions, just send them home. Elisha spoke for God. What God do we believe in? The God of Elisha, thank you. Not the God of Jericho. It comes down to today's world. Here in Seattle, what God do you believe in? The God of Mark Driscoll? No. The God that we worship is the God of healing and restoration, the God of reconciliation and peace. The God who say, beat your swords into plowshares. Quit waving them around. Dig them in the dirt and build something. That's the God we serve. And when we do a good job of cooperating with the God of Elisha, when we join with God in making peace, in bringing healing, in pursuing reconciliation, when we join with God, not chasing retribution, but reconciliation, our young atheists will listen to what we say and they will look 
at what we do and they'll go, yeah, that's what I meant. If we speak well enough of the beautiful God who is, the shepherd God, I expect that many of our young atheist friends will eventually find their way to going, yeah, that's what I believe. That, that God has won my heart. I pledge my allegiance. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.